Hello, welcome to St. Peter and St. Paul United Church of Christ, our online worship. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. We thank you for tuning in and we thank our video production team. We have Joel and Mary Beth and Aaron Westermeyer here and we are grateful for their hard work in putting our videos together and we're grateful to you for joining us for worship. We hope that this is a, a blessed experience for you as we worship God together. Uh, so let us prepare our hearts and our spirits now on this third Sunday of Lent and let us uh, listen to our prelude and go to God in worship. Please join me for our call to worship. A rich feast awaits those who call upon the Lord. God offers us all the bounty of God's love. How we have thirsted for hope and peace. How we have longed for joy and love. God continually blesses and heals us. Praise be to God for God's steadfast love. Amen. Our first hymn is hymn number 622, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Please join me for our invocation. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our spirits this morning, Lord, so that we may be healed of our faithlessness, freed from our fears and anxieties, and placed on the pathways that lead to peace and service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now turn to God in humility and in confession. Let us open ourselves to God's gracious love. Please join me for our prayer of confession. This, this is the season of turning. We are called on this journey to turn our lives to the Lord and to turn away from all those things which have harmed us and others. 
we are called to separate ourselves from actions and attitudes that demean and destroy. It is far too easy for us to sink into the mire of self-pity and self-serving attitudes, wondering why everything isn't coming our way. We want comfort, contentment, no stress, and no struggle, yet our lives are filled with stress and discontent. We hurt, Lord. We hurt in our bodies and our souls. We hurt in our relationships with others. How we must try your patience. We don't want to be like this. We want to feel the warmth of your love, the freedom of your spirit, and the joy of serving you. Forgive us for our selfishness and stupidity. Heal us, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are given another chance. God has heard your cries. Turn again to the Lord. Find comfort and strength in God's eternal love for you. Be healed. Amen. Amen. We come now to our time of pastoral prayer, and as we pray together, we invite you to uh, share any prayer concerns that you have uh, using our online link that's right below the video, and we'll be happy to share that concern or that joy with our congregation on Sunday mornings at our in-person worship uh, and in our weekly email that we send out uh, to the congregation. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. We continue to pray for those who are fighting on both sides of the conflict, and we pray for a peaceful resolution to that difficult and terrible situation. We pray for people around the world who are experiencing the conflict of war and uh, the suffering that goes with it. We pray for those who are struggling with life's greatest challenges, with hunger, with poverty. We bring to God today all of our personal needs, the needs of our families and friends, the personal prayers that we come to worship with today, and we turn them all over to God. And we pray that God will respond to these needs that we bring, and we pray that God will bless us and give us strength as we continue on our Lenten journey. So I invite you now to bow with me as we go to God in prayer. O oh God, looking only because of the promise of finding, calling out only because we are sure we are heard. We meet in one another's company, in person and online, so that we may meet with you, God of love, who is richer than life. We look only because we were first sought out. You, we tell you we are here only because you first came to us. Help us by your Spirit to seek you more, even as we have been fully found. Everlasting, ever gracious, ever seeking, and ever calling God. Yours is the offer of life because the gift of life itself is yours. You call the universe into being and through many interactions, space and time come to be. Stars and galaxies form. Their dust gives potential for life. And we find ourselves here alive and praising you today. We are awestruck not only at the grandeur of creation, but at the miracle of the Incarnation. You choose in Jesus the Christ to be born of one of us, living among us, showing your grace and telling your love. To be excluded from us, shunned and hated, dying among us, and yet still showing grace and declaring love. To meet us risen, inviting us to listen that we may live. O God of endless goodness, we praise you. We bring to you our needs, the needs of our loved ones and friends, the needs of our neighbors near and far, who need your loving and supportive hand in their lives. We pray for peace in our world. We pray for the people of Ukraine 
and those who fight on both sides. We pray that you would help the leaders of the world bring this conflict and other conflicts around the world to a peaceful and just resolution. For your church in the world at this time, we pray, may your people everywhere be enthused to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. May new believers be welcomed, taught, baptized, and nurtured. May loving service be our ready response to human need. May your people work to transform the unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, to pursue peace and reconciliation. And may we as your children strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth which you have entrusted to us. O Lord, we bring these concerns to you as well as unspoken concerns now that we offer to you in these moments of silence. We offer all of these prayers, spoken and unspoken to you, O God, and in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. The prophet writes, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that we may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call the nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you, shall run to you, because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our gospel reading today is from Luke's gospel, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. At that very time there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those eighteen who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, 
you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand upright. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, she immediately stood up straight and began praising God. May God bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of this God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, someone told me that I should stop acting like a flamingo, so I had to put my foot down. <laughs> and how does NASA organize a party? They plan it. Mia McLean shares the following reflection of something that she learned from her mother during her growing up years. She writes, When I'd get in trouble as a child, maybe I left dirty dishes in the sink after my mother had already cleaned the kitchen, or I got a bad grade on my report card, I'd undoubtedly offer a teary-eyed apology to help cut down on the punishment. Her mother would ask, why didn't you tell me you were struggling in science three months ago? Why do I have to find out from your teacher that you got an F on the test? And Mia would reply, I'm sorry, Ma. And then she inserts puppy eyes here, she says. And her mother would say, don't say I'm sorry, Ma. Show me you're sorry. She was helping me understand, Mia writes, helping me understand the difference between apology and repentance, the difference between a coerced confession and a self-initiated change. Mia McLean's story reminds me of a moment when I was going through Air Force, Air Force uh, commissioned officer training many years ago. We were learning proper military customs and courtesies. We had been given a lesson on proper reporting uh, to an outranking officer, and I was trying to speak to one of the officer training officers and I made a mistake in the way that I addressed him and in the way that I was standing at attention which he very quickly pointed out to me and immediately I said I'm sorry sir and he replied to me don't apologize just learn to do it right the training officer was telling me something very similar to Mia McLean's mother we can say that we're sorry we can say we're sorry to God and we can say we're sorry to each other we can apologize for what we have done wrong. But what really matters is whether we are demonstrating to others and to God that we are trying to act and to be different and to do better in the future. Luke lets us in on a conversation Jesus was having with a group of folks one day. They were discussing a tragic, terrible thing that had happened in their nation one of the sad current events that they mentioned was an incident in which a group of Galileans uh, was, were murdered by the Roman authorities as they were worshiping. Jesus' response to them gives us a clue into how the conversation may have been going. Jesus asks them, Do you think that these Galileans suffered in this way because they were worse sinners than the other Galileans? We ask those kinds of questions, don't we? Why are those folks suffering? Uh, why are they suffering what they're suffering? Why is that person going through what they're going through? Did they do something to deserve this? Did they do something to offend God? Are they being punished? We especially ask that question when those who are suffering are people that we don't particularly like or we have some animosity against. Perhaps it is our hope that God is punishing them for some kind of wrongdoing. 
But Jesus challenges that way of conventional thinking just as he always challenges conventional ways of thinking. Do you really think they were any worse than people who do not suffer such fate, Jesus was asking them. In other words, there are no easy answers as to why people suffer the way that they do. It is hard to pinpoint a reason, and the reality is the terrible thing that happened to those Galileans could happen to anyone, Jesus is suggesting. But Jesus does use the moment to teach his listeners something about repentance. But I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. The Greek word in the New Testament for repent is metanoieo, which means to change one's mind or purpose, to change course or, to, or direction, or to amend. It means to make a change, to turn things around and to go in a different, different direction. It appears that the folks Jesus was conversing with were focused on other people's sins and other people suffering and trying to tie the two together. Jesus wants to turn the conversation around to get them to think about their own lives and their own situation, their own sins, and to invite them to change their attitudes and their actions. We do indeed spend a lot of time thinking about other people and what is happening to them and what they've done. There's a large money-making industry of popular media that gets us thinking about the lives of celebrities, the lives of well-known people. And as we focus on their lives, we too often forget to tend to our own spiritual well-being, our own emotional and mental and physical well-being. Jesus is redirecting the folks with whom he is speaking and trying to get them to think less, to focus less on the sins of the Galileans who were killed and more time focusing on their own sins while they are living and while they, are, while, they still, while they still have an opportunity to do something about their own lives. Jesus offers another example. Or those 18, he says, who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. This was apparently another situation they were all familiar with. A tragic moment in which 18 people in Jerusalem were killed. Like the Galileans, they were not worse sinners than anyone else. They just happened to, be, uh, to experience a terrible moment that took their lives. But you, Jesus is telling his friends, you still have the opportunity to do something about your life. You still have an opportunity to address the problems and the struggles of your life. You still have an opportunity to think about your own sins, and to repent of those sins. Don't worry about the sins of others. Let God take care of that. You can do something now to bring more hope and more promise to your life. And Jesus indicates that a key component to renewing our lives spiritually is repentance. Now we modern people and we mainline Protestant people may be a little nervous with words like repent. When we think of someone using the word repent, we may picture an old-time, hard-shell kind of preacher or an evangelist preaching at a revival, dabbing his forehead with a handkerchief, pounding the pulpit, and calling people to repent lest they burn in eternal torment. Jesus doesn't seem to be yelling at anyone here or trying to shame anyone or scare anyone. Instead, he seems to be offering an important insight about the reality of life. If we neglect the spiritual part of our lives, if we reject the spiritual in life, if we neglect the connection that we have with God and with people, if we live only for ourselves, only for the moment, if we live with uh, no thought about how our actions will affect others, then we risk having our lives wither up, wither and, and dry up. In other words, we run the risk of bearing no fruit in life. Jesus expands this idea in what he says next in a parable. The parable is about a man who planted a fig tree in his vineyard. But every time he came to gather fruit from his fig tree, there was nothing. There was no fruit. No, the tree was not yielding any fruit. So the man said to the gardener, I'm tired of this fig tree. It, it's not producing any figs. It's taking up space. It's using up soil. And it's not doing anyone any good. I want you to cut it down. 
But the gardener, who apparently was a patient man, talked the landowner out of destroying the tree, at least at that moment. Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. And if it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, then you can cut it down. Let's try again, the gardener was pleading. Let's give this tree a little more time. Maybe with some extra care and attention, maybe with some tending, you will see fruit on it over the next year. And then our efforts will not have been wasted. Now, when I read this parable, I notice something. We are not told what happens at, after the, the parable is finished. We are not told if the landowner agrees. And if he does agree, we are not told if the gardener's efforts were successful. I wonder why the story seems to be unfinished. It may be that Jesus is leaving it up to his listeners to decide what happens next. Maybe they are determined. Maybe we are to determine what happens to the fig tree because they themselves and we ourselves are the fig tree. Jesus is calling them and us to make sure that we are tending to our lives and our relationships so that we see our lives bearing fruit, producing good things, so that our lives do not wither like a fruitless fig tree, but keeps producing the good things of life and of the Spirit of God. Paul tells the Galatians in his letter that the fruit of the Spirit is, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we're bearing fruit in life, our lives will reflect the fruit of the Spirit. We will be striving to walk in love. We will be trying to find joy. We will be working for peace within ourselves and with those around us. We'll be trying to be more patient, more generous, more faithful, more gentle. We will be trying to practice better self-control. Living fruitful lives does not mean that we will always get all of these things right, but that we will be making efforts to turn our lives around, to repent with God's help so that our lives will bring about good things rather than emptiness, rather than fruitlessness. Jesus leaves the parable open-ended. He leaves the parable open for us to decide what will happen to the fig tree and what will happen with each of our lives. Our passage does end, however, with a story of healing. We are told that uh, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath and a woman appeared to him, a woman with a spirit, that had been crippled that had crippled her for 18 years she was bent over and was unable to stand up straight and when jesus saw her he called over to her and said uh, to her woman you are set free from your ailment and when he laid his hands on her immediately she stood up straight and began praising god our passage concludes with the story of a woman who's been suffering for 18 years she had a spirit luke says that prevented her from standing up straight Luke doesn't say, but it is likely that people looked at her for 18 years and asked, what did she do? Why is she suffering? Is God punishing her for something? And Jesus doesn't point fingers or place blame. He simply calls to her in love and compassion and declares that she's being set free from her ailment. With the healing touch of his hands, she stood up straight and began praising God. Perhaps our reading ends here as a reminder that with the help of Jesus, it is never too late for our lives to be changed. It is never too late for our lives to be turned around. We can begin bearing fruit or begin bearing greater fruit anytime, anytime we are willing to reorient our lives toward God and toward others, toward what is good and just and life-giving. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us repent and let us bear fruit. Amen. I invite you to join me in affirming our faith as we say together these words by Lisa Friends. I believe in God the Creator, who made me in all things, who set me on my path in this world. I believe in God the Savior, who is one with the Creator, who rescued me in all creation, from the depredations of our violations against God and creation. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, walked a path through this world, taking on human form, having been born of a woman through the power of the Holy Spirit. He lived and worked in this world among people just like me. 
He walked walked God's God's path to death on a cross and rose from the dead to open our pathway to eternal life. I believe in God, the Holy Spirit, my counselor and guide, who is one with the Creator and the Christ, who through the body and blood of Jesus brings me into communion with all people, past, present, and future, who calls me to walk a sacred way of life through this world, caring for creation and the people I meet on the way, loving them, helping them, welcoming them without prejudice, being God's hands and feet in the world. Our next hymn is hymn number 557, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. grateful to you for your continued support of our church and our shared ministry together. As recipients of the generosity of God, let us share our generosity with each other and the community.
Please join me for our prayer of dedication. For the wondrous ways this offering will bless this community, we dedicate these gifts. For the ways it will help us nurture caring relationships with our neighbors, we dedicate these gifts. Let both this offering and the works of our hands and feet be good fruit in the world. Amen. Our final hymn is number 354, Seek Ye First. Thank you for worshiping with us. We hope that the service has been a blessing to you. We hope that you have a great week ahead of you, and we look forward to worshiping with you again very soon. God bless you, sisters and brothers, friends in Christ. God has called you to bear witness to hope and goodness. Know that you have been healed of all that prevents you from serving God. Go forth with God's love and blessing to bring good news to this hurting world. Go in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. Oh,